Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Pearls of Wisdom podcast. Today, I will be interviewing Dr. Jeffrey Nicholas, who teaches philosophy at Providence College, on his book, Reason, Tradition, and the Good. In this book, Jeff seeks, among other things, to synthesize elements from Alistair McIntyre and Frankfurt School critical theory to explain how reason can help build a just society. Jeff, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Thanks for having me here. My pleasure. Um, so why don't you first tell us about um, yourself and your work? So uh, as you said, I'm a professor at Providence College. I teach philosophy, uh, focusing on politics and ethics, uh, particularly ethics with the community. My research is broad because politics is broad. So I do a number of things, uh, including issues related to uh, midwifery, uh, issues related to general practices and medicine, uh, issues related to common goods, critiques of liberalism, critiques of conservatism, uh, as well as uh, a variety of uh, issues related to uh, uh, theological, uh, particularly Catholic issues in America and um, Catholic interventions in politics. And uh, as well, I, I do a little bit of research in science fiction because it is known as the literature of progress. So if we're going to talk about making society better, it seems like a good place to start. All right, right. Thanks. And so today we're here to discuss your book, uh, Reason, Tradition, and the Good, um, uh, McIntyre's Tradition Constituted Reason and, and Frankfurt School Critical Theory. So why don't you tell us, um, how did this book come about? The book was kind of an odd project, I guess, because it wasn't what I had imagined I would be writing. I hadn't thought that I would be writing about McIntyre. Uh, when I first read him, you know, he was fine reading After Virtue, but it wasn't clicking the sort of things that bothered me about modernity. And I got into McIntyre, I guess, uh, as a, a backstopper, you know, a, a way to think about the questions raised by the Frankfurt School, particularly Horkheimer, Adorno, and Marcuse, regarding the failure of rationality in the modern era, right? Horkheimer and Adorno writing during and after World War II. And you can see, you know, just this failure of reason to organize society. And Marcuse are writing in, well, throughout a long period, but particularly in the 60s and uh, 70s with this concept of technical rationality. And so these, they raised questions that I couldn't find an answer to. And it turned out that these same sorts of discussions were raised in debates about reason and rationality in the social sciences in the 70s. And McIntyre was involved in those kinds of discussions. So that uh, introduced me into that kind of conversation. Right. Um, so your, your book critiques um, what you call the um, uh, project of the Enlightenment, um, particularly for its um, uh, def what you call its deformed concept of reason. Can, can you please um, explain that a bit more? Sure. So again, this is kind of an odd sort of thing because I guess my project began with reading Voltaire and mm -hmm. he's, he has this little story uh, called the, um, the story of the Brahmin. Mm -hmm. And it's a story about these two people walking along and they're, uh, the Brahmin is very unhappy and they pass this woman who's just washing clothes. Mm -hmm. And she seems so happy, even though she lives this kind of in their eyes, very impoverished life, whereas they live, you know, this very nice life and they're able to sit back and reflect. And the question that Voltaire asked there is, is why is she happy and I'm not? And so that sort of raised this kind of question about what role does reason have in our lives, which gets intensified by the Frankfurt School after a couple hundred years, right? So what happens in between? Well, the Enlightenment project is really what Voltaire was working for, right? to use reason to bring people to enlightenment or to a better society? How do we make a better world? 
with the use of reason and getting away from myth, getting away from superstition, which was rampant in the Middle Ages, obviously, but this begins to come into criticism uh, during the Enlightenment period, more so with this emphasis on reason can help us solve these problems. So the, the project of Enlightenment is exactly that. Answering social ills, trying to address social ills through the use of reason. The problem, as I see it, following Horkheimer in particular, is that the reason that Enlightenment philosophers and those after them embraced is a denatured reason. It doesn't have a capacity to help us evaluate what we're doing in society. So we have this goal, let's make society better, and yet the tool that we use can't help us do that. And so we make all of these plans and we can't evaluate, are they gonna lead us to oppression? What kind of oppression, what does oppression look like? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the, the inadequacy in my idea of what enlightenment rationality entails. And I can go into more depth in that, or you can just read uh, the book, right. which might be nicer. Okay, <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. No, we can, perhaps we can re revisit this later. Um, so, sure. uh, all right. So, um, well, maybe not, maybe now's the time for that. So can you tell us about, um, you have an, an alternative to, um, what you, 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 you distinguish between, um, between technical rationality or, and, um, substantive reason. So, um, can you explain that distinction? And you also talked about, um, uh, the importance of evaluating ends and, um, and the importance of, um, not, uh, differentiating s spheres of rationality. Yeah. Excellent. So I, I thank you. So, Rationality in after the rise of modern science takes on this peculiar form that it didn't have before or that it had in addition to the other form, right? So the rationality becomes focused primarily on classification and instrumental inference. Mm -hmm. So you can look at a variety of moral theories. And of course, I'm painting broadly and we can go into more discussion mm -hmm. But broadly speaking, deontological moral theories categorize things, right? This is right. This is wrong. What makes this right? The different categories that are there. And utilitarian ethics, obviously, is an instrumental sort of rationality. They lack any reference to an end, a view of the world by which we might be able to judge what it is that we're doing. Is this the the best thing for us to do to achieve flourishing, right? The notion of flourishing, well, of course, for Kant, that becomes a side issue, right? If we try to reason according to what makes us happy, his word, right? Then we end up d doing something that's not possible, right? The instincts lead us to happiness more so than reason does, according to Kant. And then, of course, I think he follows Hume on that point. So what Hume and... Uh, later uh, utilitarians do is say, well, let's think about what we're doing with reason. Reason can only be the slave of the passion, so let's order our passions correctly. So my, my understanding of substantive reason, so I use the term substantive there to show that there's some kind of substance to it, that there's some kind of idea of what the good is and of what human life is about. Now, in the, in the past, pre-enlightenment, Right, that was given by theological answers or metaphysical answers. What I try to do is embed the notion of substantive reason within the tradition that people are in. Mm -hmm. Habermas might call this the life world, uh, but we can think broadly about what it, what's the culture and place that we're in in our world. Habermas doesn't do that, by the way. So Jürgen Habermas is the second generation Frankfurt School. He inherits this sort of project from the Frankfurt School and he develops this idea of community of rationality. But he believes that the rationa rationality has evolved into three distinct spheres in modernity. One that covers aesthetic issues, one that covers law and moral issues, and one that covers scientific issues. So he sort of breaks out these different kinds of questions that we might ask that earlier views of reason, Aristotelian, Thomas, uh, we could talk about other varieties, right, would think all belong together. And I think that they, the earlier philosophers, are correct because we can't really ask 
what the truth is in science without thinking about what human life is. And we can't ask about the purpose of art without thinking about those questions too. I think that's actually one of the interesting things about uh, Herbert Marcuse, one of the members of the first generation of Franklin School, is that he does tie aesthetic reason into um, technological rationality, right? It's an answer to some of the, the problems with technological rationality. So Habermas, I think, is a dead end, and we have to do something more to get the substance back in there, and that comes from the tradition. Right. Um, okay, so um, we're going to be using, uh, uh, or I suspect we're going to be using the term tradition a lot, so um, can you offer us a, a working definition of that term, please? Sure. So a tradition, as I like to think of it today, so this is slightly different from the book, but as I like to think of it today, is a historically and socially group of people arguing with each other and with outsiders about what the good is and other fundamental agreements. So I emphasize that it's people, right? The tradition is people having a conversation about what is the good? Okay. What is reason? Whereas before I was saying, I was following uh, Alistair McIntyre and saying tradition is a set of arguments. Right, right. Well, arguments don't occur you know, without people arguing about them. All right. Um, so, and I'm, are, are you using um, tradition in, in a broad sense or do you just mean um, intellectual tradition? No, that's a great question. So I'm sure we'll talk about Alistair McIntyre later, but uh, so McIntyre, I think uses the concept of tradition in an intellectual sense. Mm -hmm. And what I think I do in reason tradition to good is to take that and apply it to what I call natural traditions, or today I might call just generally culture or traditions mm -hmm. um, and s investigate how the good and reason and practices interact for everyday people. So I get away from humanism, Kantianism, Aristotle, and I talk about the Lakota, uh, the, what many people know as the Sioux, right? This Native American tribe that occupies the Dakota area of the United States and lived a, lived a nomadic life and had a treaty with the United States. They hunted buffalo, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? They're, they're the ones who are led the... Uh, uh, no dapple protest, right? The against the Dakota Access Pipeline in the United States. Um, so I examine what their tradition looks like in a couple of instances. I also look at the Azandi, who are uh, a people in, um, I think it's sub Sahara, but close to um, the North Africa mm -hmm. uh, area. Right. And, and you also, um, and you um, also examine um, Roman Catholicism alongside those other traditions, interestingly enough. Yes, I do look at Roman Catholicism as well and, and have continued to kind of uh, process that uh, as a lived tradition. Mm, yes, lived tradition. Okay. So, um, and now we, um, we can get to um, McIntyre. So um, can you tell us who is McIntyre and what was um, the Frankfurt School and why, why do you um, bring them into dialogue into your book? Why did you think they, they're a good um, pair? Okay, so feel free to cut me off if I start no. speaking too long. No worries. So Alistair McIntyre uh, was born in uh, 1929. Mm -hmm. He uh, was educated in Britain at some of the finest schools. Uh, he was a member of the New Left in Britain uh, during the 50s and 60s, uh, broke with the New Left, uh, broke with Christianity. So he, mm -hmm. he was Christian for a while. Uh, and moved to the United States uh, and was lost in the wilderness mm. uh, for a while until he wrote uh, and published After Virtue, mm -hmm. uh, which really changed the dialogue in not, I, I don't want to say virtue ethics because he wants to eschew the concept of virtue ethics as, as a misnomer, but in Aristotelian philosophy, political philosophy in general, and has had this wonderful career uh, since publishing that. But what a lot of people do is they read after virtue mm -hmm. 
and then they don't read anything else. Right, right. <laughs> and so they see him as this sort of conservative Aristotelian or conservative Catholic. But what you need to do is trace back what he's doing to his early essays when he was a Marxist, hmm. when he was criticizing liberalism and still today criticizes liberalism. So he should not be associated with uh, conservatives. The Frankfurt School is a group of uh, people that began in 1928 uh, during the Weimar Republic and established this institute, which was Marxist, even though they tried to uh, avoid that terminology for political reasons. Okay. That involved this sort of interdisciplinary research into the problems of society. Uh, so Adorno was a music theorist. Um, Horkheimer, and, Horkheimer and, and Marcuse were philosophers, but they also had political economists uh, and sociologists involved in this uh, research. And of course, they had, um, sorry, psychoanalysts involved as well. Looking at what caused the kinds of problems, particularly that the Weimar Republic faced, but once they uh, immigrated away from the, the uh, Germany after the rise of Hitler, into what has led to the problems of the West. And it all centers around what Alex uh, Honneth, uh, who is um, second generation Frankfurt School, uh, calls the disease of reason. And so I, I think that's an interesting way to think about what critical theory is. I think we can think of it more broadly speaking, but if we're talking about the Frankfurt School itself, we're talking about this particular group of people who have this common project to think about what the disease of reason is. So how did I bring these two uh, groups into conversation? Well, again, as I suggested at, at the beginning of the interview, it was happenstance. Okay. I had, I had this, I, I really enjoyed more than reading almost any other philosophy, reading the Frankfurt School, reading the dialectic of enlightenment, reading Marcuse's Eros and Civilization and One Dimensional Man, and trying to think about the questions that they were asking in there about this problem of reason, which really goes back to, to Voltaire in some sense. And why is the world so messed up, right? You can just look out the window and see mm -hmm. how, I mean, this is much more true today than it was, you know, mm -hmm. uh, even when I thought of the book. So, um, and I didn't know that I would find an answer in McIntyre. It was only through thinking about reason and thinking about what rationality was, which led me to McIntyre, that I came up with this idea that, oh, wait a minute, we can't find the answer in Habermas, who thinks he has this answer, because he still falls to the kinds of criticism that Horkheimer um, use this against enlightenment rationality, we have to really turn to something or to a, a theory that looks at what makes it possible for us to use our reason to evaluate what's going on in our society. And that was McIntyre. Right. Okay. So uh, now can you tell us about, um, both, so McIntyre and um, the Frankfurt School, they're both um, concerned to um, uh, critique modernity in their respective ways. So can you tell us how they, um, how they did so? Sure, and I, I should emphasize um, that McIntyre began as a Marxist critic. And even though he is seen as rejecting Marxism in 1981 with After Virtue, he only rejects Marxism as a political program, that is, as the sort of thing that you see in the Soviet Union or Cuba or that sort of thing. Uh, and I might disagree with him on that, but that's that's a side point. So that in 2017, when he publishes Ethics in the Conflicts of Modernity, he says, no, we actually have to continue to read Marx. Oh. So the, um, the solutions that they have, the, the problem with the Frankfurt School is that they were very good at diagnosing the issue and not so good at coming up with solutions. So Horkheimer's work is all critical. And if the Dialectic of Enlightenment seems like too big of a book for you to get into, uh, his uh, critique of uh, critique of reason uh, is, uh, sorry, Eclipse of Reason is a, a much better book to get into. And I actually have uh, YouTube videos that go through each chapter of that. The only one that I 
think of from the first generation as providing some kind of solution was Marcuse. And the problem with Marcuse is he related his solution to this sort of theory of human nature, which he never really developed. And you can read some of um, uh, Andrew Feenberg's essays on this issue. And I, I agree with Feenberg that Marcuse has this idea that the, the answer is in human nature somehow, but he never really developed a concept of human nature. And I think that's what's interesting about McIntyre is that he does have this sort of um, nebulous concept of human nature uh, hidden in after virtue, but that comes out more fully in dependent rational animals. McIntyre's answer though, is to look at our practices, our everyday activities and to find the telos of our activity or the, the ends of our lives in these kinds of everyday practices and in the communities that we build around these practices, right? So there's a, a student, a graduate student at um, uh, McGill who is working on Irish music in Canada as a particular practice, which maintains these kinds of ends and goods that, that help us to direct our lives. Uh, I've looked at Dungeons and Dragons as an example or Roman Catholicism as an example. So McIntyre's answer is to be much more practical to, to look at our everyday activities, which is something that you would think the Frankfurt School would do because they their objective was to look at how people live in their everyday lives. And that's why they had this, this, this social research institute that was supposed to investigate the everyday lives of, of people, but they never got out of theory really. Um, until third generation. Um, so I, I think, did I answer your question? Yes. I'm not sure that I quite got uh, yeah, Yes, okay. I, I think, yeah, that, that was adequate, thanks. Um, so uh, you mentioned uh, Horkheimer and Adorno's um, dialectic uh, of enlightenment. Uh, I was hoping you, you could perhaps um, tell us more about that. Sorry, I missed what you said. No, oh, um, you, you, were, you, were, you mentioned uh, Horkheimer and Adorno's um, dialectic of enlightenment. So can you, can you tell us um, just more about that? The Dialect of Enlightenment is a, a fascinating book. I know fascinating is sort of this throwaway word, but um, I just love reading it. And it's broken into a couple different parts. One part that I teach in my classes quite often is this discussion of Odysseus uh, from the Odyssey. And the reason I teach that section is because A, it's easy to understand. Uh, and B, because my students have all read some part of the Odyssey because of our educational program at Providence College. So Odysseus, the, the story that I focus on is Odysseus comes to uh, this island where the sirens are going to be. And he knows that if he hears the song of the sirens, he and his men on the ship will be lost and they'll be infatuated and they'll dive into the sea and they will become slaves or maybe even eaten by the sirens. So he knows he can't do that but he wants to hear this song. So he has his, his men tie him to the mast of his ship so he can't get loose. Mm -hmm. Then he has them plug their ears with wax. So his sailors cannot hear the siren song, so they'll not be entranced, but he'll be able to hear it, but he can't get away to become a slave to the sirens. And for Horkheimer and Adorno, this is a a sign of what modern human life is like. We repress or constrain our desires so much that we cannot fulfill them. And we either do that by just shutting off our desires the way the sailors do. And so this is what happens with many workers, right? And this is sort of a Marx, this is Marx's point, right? In the factory or in the life of the worker, we simply, change what our desires are, right? We no longer desire real freedom, we desire to vote. We no longer desire meaningful engagement in conversation, hopefully like what we, you and I are having right now. <laughs> and we desire to talk about baseball and there's nothing wrong with baseball. <laughs> and then the master, right? can't satisfy his desires because he's tied to the system, the ship of capitalism. Mm -hmm. 
So the dialect of enlightenment is, is not just that story, but that's part of the story and it sort of helps us to understand what the whole work is. So the first part of the work is talking about the relationship between myth and rationality and gets into some heavy theory about this relationship and what myth is and what rationality is and comes to this criticism of rationality as this enlightenment rationality that we've talked about, devoid of anything by which we can judge our, our reason. And then Odysseus provides one example and uh, the Marquis de Sade provides another example of how this happens, right? And then there's um, further discussion about what they call fragments about what's going on in society. And one of, one of the, two of the most interesting things there is their linking of what they've said before to the domination of nature so that the domination of nature is part of capitalism which is somewhat in Marx, but is not really clarified in a lot of Marxism before then. Um, it, it gets a lot more focused now with uh, 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 Bellamy Foster and his work. And then the second thing is to tie that domination of nature to the domination of women and to racism, uh, particularly anti-Semitism. So it's, it, it covers a lot of the sorts of issues that we are still dealing with today from this sort of very theoretical, but also uh, passionate critique of this modern capitalistic individual. So, um, and just just out of um, curiosity, I, I would be um, curious to know um, how how do um, your students um, react to this material, or what's it like on um, teaching this stuff to, to students? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> So I think when I when I focus on Odysseus and I focus on the domination of nature, they get it and they understand. And I think that the younger college age generation today really does understand that environment and climate change is an issue. And they're really concerned about it. On the other hand, they don't have any answers does anybody that doesn't require a complete and radical change from our everyday capitalistic life. Mm -hmm. And so this is something that particularly our culture uh, at a uh, upper middle class, mostly white school in the Northeast of the United States can't really contemplate too well. Right. So there's this tension. And I think this tension is everywhere. I mean, I've seen this in many students, but there's this tension you know, between realizing what the problem is and recognizing like, oh, wow, that's something interesting to think about Odysseus and what's going on there. And then saying, but capitalism is all we've got. And I can get on Tinder tonight and not worry about it. Okay. That's a little cynical and I don't like to be cynical because <laughs> I think there's more hope there than, than cynicism, but. I see what you mean. <laughs> so. <laughs> Now, now, um, so McIntyre developed this, um, this theory of uh, tradition constituted um, reason. So, um, we 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 talked a bit about that. Um, but I would like to ask you specifically about um the role language ha um has to play in um tradition constituted reason because in your book you write that um each language is um cosmology laden. So, could you please um elaborate on that? Yeah. So just to clarify. Um, I wouldn't say, and I hope I didn't say then, that each language, oh. because McIntyre recognizes that there are some languages that are so flexible in interpretation that they're not cos cosmology right. right. So I English is one of them. No, that's okay. Mm -hmm. So English is one of those, right? English is so flexible that we can talk about uh, Dasein and we can talk about uh, Hinduism, right? We can ask what's the relationship between Hume's no self and uh, the Buddhist non-self, as if we're talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. But that's not what's really going on, right? A, a tradition cosmology-laden language is one that embodies a worldview. And to really understand what that worldview is, you have to be able to speak that language either as a first language or as a second first language, right? And uh, in the United States, we're not very good at learning <laughs> second languages um, but it, it 
becomes important to understand how the words that are part of this language fill out or make attempts at pointing to a variety of issues within our vision of the world. So that when we talk about a cosmology laden language, when we t use a particular word or a set of words, what we are really talking about is a picture of the world, mm -hmm. right? So when the Lakota uh, talk about Pahasapa, which the United States calls the Black Hills and which um, has the uh, Mount Rushmore on it, they are thinking about the center of the universe. Mm. And it's not just a place where you know, everything runs through it, but it's a holy site in which individual people who are crying for a vision can connect to the universe at large. And it's connected to that particular site. So when the, they signed the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty, which ceded Pahasapa to them uh, until the rivers run dry, right? In per uh, perpetuity, they were making a sacrifice of their lives, the way that they lived their lives in order to have access to this very sacred place. Mm -hmm. But of course, when we think about it, that is, white people today in the United States, right? We think about Mount Rushmore and maybe going there on a vacation and and seeing, you know, the faces of the president and whose face is going to be on there next. Maybe it's Ronald Reagan, maybe it's somebody else. Um, and we don't have that connection to this sacred site, right? right? And there's there's not many. Um, there's not many ways of thinking about that except as, you know, this sort of national kind of identity, right? Um, so the, the language of the Lakota is referring to something in their cosmology that only makes sense in their cosmology. And the concept of property is not part of their cosmology. So they don't really, they don't think of owning the land, right? Own, owning the land is like owning your mother. Oh. Right, which is nonsense. Right. So the, that's the way that a cosmology laden language works. I hope that makes some sense. Yeah, um, that, that was good. And um, just just to um, clarify for you, would you say um, co a cosmology, um, as you define it, would you say it's synonymous with um, a worldview? Yes. Yes. Oh, all right. Just making sure. So uh, now, now I, um, I would like to ask you, um, what is um, we talked about um, tradition constituted reason. So now um, what is um, your your appraisal and your revision of um, of McIntyre's um, uh, analysis of reason? Well, don't ask any easy questions. <laughs> um, so my appraisal of McIntyre's understanding of tradition constituted reason is that he has hooked onto something that's right. So uh, tradition constituted reason for McIntyre is focused on the way that we develop our practical rationality by looking at the kinds of answers to questions, particularly questions about the good, but also other uh, questions about the cosmology, what kind of world we live in, in the different traditions that we might occupy, whether it's Roman Catholicism or Aristotelianism or Lakota Sioux tradition, okay? Where I make a criticism here is that he doesn't, for me, connect the relationship between the conception of the good and the standards of reason within a tradition with the connection uh, of human nature, what human nature is for us. So let me kind of say a little bit more about what that means. So when I talk about standards of reason, these can be very broad or very specific, but they're, they're sort of the aphorisms we might say, or the, the kind of rules of thumbs by which we might 
think about how we live our life, right? So um, owning the land is like owning your mother would be sort of a, a standard reason, right? You can't own something like that. It would be irrational. If we look at science, we could pick these out fairly easy, easily, right? The second law of thermodynamics or the law that you can't uh, uh, proceed or at the, uh, you can't go faster than the speed of light, right? Uh, a law that of course is violated in almost every space opera. So, so in human life, what we do is we think about our actions in terms of these traditional ideas of what it is reasonable to do that are handed down to us, but they're informed by, informed is sort of a vague kind of word they get their substance they get their rationality from the idea of the good that we have in our society mm -hmm. right so if i have an idea about my relationship with nature and that means that nature is my mother in a real way then the idea that i can't own land because it's like owning my mother is makes much more sense right and we can think about uh, other kinds of uh, ideas like that where we get this understanding of the rule of thumb or however we might think about it as a guide to our life. And of course, they're guides in the sense that they're, they make moments for us to reflect on what we're doing in our everyday life so that we know how to proceed. And of course, they might come into conflict or we might have to interpret what they mean in particular situations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they also tie to our conception of the human, of human nature. And this is something that McIntyre particularly doesn't recognize in After Virtue, because what he tries to do in After Virtue is say, we don't need a, a theory of human nature. What we need is this sociological concept of practice. Now, he later comes back to revise that. And so he writes a, a book, a very short book about human nature called Dependent Rational Animals. And I'm... I criticize that a little bit in my forthcoming book called Love and Politics, which will be out, I believe, in June. But he still hasn't connected that way that reason in a tradition relates to the way that we think about what it is to be human in that tradition as well. So in my book, I kind of put these things together and I, I've, I have a chart in there that sort of shows how they flow together. And I tell a couple of of uh, examples from uh, different traditions that uh, relate the concepts together, hopefully in a way better than I'm doing right now <laughs> in, this, uh, in this interview, uh, where I look at a variety of standards of reason and how they connect to our conceptions of the good and our conceptions of uh, human nature within a particular tradition. Um, so, well, as you know, a, a very common objection to McIntyre's tradition constituted reason is that it um, leads to relativism. In fact, um, uh, again, as you know, like a lot of people have um, interpreted or misinterpreted McIntyre as a relativist. So, um, uh, so uh, what do you think? Do you think that um, uh, that uh, McIntyre's theory succumbs to that objection or? Yeah. Excellent question. A common question, of course, as you said. So it depends first on what we mean by relativism, right? And so if we mean that um, we can never know the truth about anything or there is no truth, right? Those are different kinds of concepts and they don't apply to McIntyre's theory because McIntyre thinks that the way that we get to the truth is through our tradition. Mm -hmm. If they mean that relativism says that there can be more than one tradition that can be true. I don't think McIntyre has a full response to that, but also I don't think that's a worrisome problem. Okay. So the reason I don't think he has a full response is because it requires a theological response. So from a philosophical analysis, no, there's no way to know that two traditions can't both be true uh, in a, a real sense. But for McIntyre, all traditions are eventually going to come to the same truth. Um, and Charles Taylor has the same sort of uh, perspective as well. He calls it the omega point, uh, where all traditions come into the, to, to the same truth. But I think it's possible for two traditions 
and let's just take two radically disparate ones, right? The, the Lakota tradition and the Hindu tradition to have truths about the world mm -hmm. that are um, incommensurable because they don't share the same worldview and yet are true in a sense that they help us to understand and live in the world better. Now, what do we mean by truth there? We don't have an objective God's eye truth. That was one of the projects of the Enlightenment, right? That there's this objective God's eye truth that we can access through reason and math and that sort of thing. Well, no, we don't have that kind of access because we are bound by tradition. But we do have access to what the world is really like because we live in the world. And the way that we know that we that our ideas are false is because the way that we live in the world leads to more problems or leads to failure more often. So there's a bit of pragmatism in McIntyre's concept of truth, but it's a weak pragmatism, right? It's the baseline. Our tradition has to at least let us live in the world in a way where we're not just dying all the time. Okay. But there's still this other idea that, that the truth allows us to see the world the way it is but the way it is, is always going to be through the particular lens of our tradition. But that's not relativism in a strong sense, because there's still a truth there. Mm -hmm. And we can say that some traditions have held, right? The theory of phlogiston has failed. Uh, most of Newton's theories have been revised or have failed in some way, right? And then there's this big conflict. It's easy to talk about this in terms of science because we recognize some right. traditions have failed. But it's harder to say, other traditions have failed because it seems like we're making judgments about people, but that's right. not what's going on, right? We're, we're making realistic assessments about how people live in the world. Mm -hmm. And today our problem is that we haven't recognized that the traditions of Western Europe under capitalism have failed. And the reason we know they failed is because the world is changing. There's nothing we can do about it under those that partic those particular traditions, right? Because of climate change. Right. Um, so there is a truth and falsity out there and it may be extreme events that lead us to that truth and falsity, but there's still truth and falsity out there. Okay, right. So I'm, so now this raises the question that since, since, um, you know, we live in a pluralistic um, society with um, many people holding different views, different um, traditions. So to me, um, I wonder, um, given tradition constituted reason or your revision of it, how can how can how can um these how can different traditions dialogue with each other? How, do some have more truth um than uh than the than other ones? So uh, great. Um, so how do traditions dialogue with each other? Well, this takes people learning a second first language, which is difficult, although not quite as difficult as McIntyre thinks it is. So McIntyre seems to think that only a very few people have ever been able to do this, Thomas Aquinas being one of them. Um, I don't know if he recognizes that he's done this himself in terms of the way that he's understood Aristotelianism and Marxism and in terms of his own personal life because he learned to speak Gaelic from his aunt, I think it was, right, and is able to under, you know, understand that worldview in a way that helps him to understand the kind of philosophy that he's putting together. Um, so it's difficult, but it's not impossible. And I think people outside of the United States probably do this much more commonly than people in the United States do. I've been trying to learn Lakota uh, for a while and try to understand that tradition from that perspective. Um, but I'm not anywhere near what I would like to be. So the first thing that has to happen is learning a second first language. And the second thing has to be willingness to learn from others. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something, and I talk about this quite a bit in the final chapter of, of Reason, Tradition, and Good, that we don't spend enough time learning from or even expecting that we can learn from other traditions, mm -hmm. right? And if we look at the conflicts today, Right, it's always about you know this group against that group, or 
Uh, it's a combat of resources and it's never a discussion about what we can learn. So we often say, it, even on the left, in the, the left, which is not really a left in the United States, right? Um, we hear people say, oh, but the uh, immigrants contribute so much to American life. But they don't say anything about what we can learn from the way that these other people live, right? The people who are coming into our country because we want to protect the American way of life. Right. So the, aside from learning that second first language, which can't be done just by translation, mm -hmm. right? Because translation is particularly into English is uh, such an asset that it washes away a lot of the cosmology. We have to be able to listen to other people. Now, can that happen in a local community? It would be difficult, but yes, I think it can happen. And, and hopefully my uh, forthcoming book talks about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. But it also happens in a way where we can live with each other and respect each other without ending in conflict. So people who play baseball and people, people who play cricket might not want to play each other's games but they can respect those games enough that both can find a place in the same community. Okay. Right. And when we're talking about cricket and baseball, we're talking about two different languages, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're two different games. They can't be played by the same rules. Um, so it's certainly easier to learn how to play cricket after you've learned how to play bas baseball or vice versa than it is say to learn Lakota or whatever after you've learned English. But that's the sort of vision that I have for uh, future possibilities here. Right. And um, you also discuss the concept of an epistemological crisis in your book. So sometimes one way to um, abandon that or one way in which one may come to abandon um, his tradition or, or her tradition is by realizing that um, it, it, ha it sets out standards that um, the tradition itself fails to meet. So could you perhaps um, tell us more about that? Yeah, excellent. Thank you for asking about that. Of course, epistemological crisis is a term that McIntyre uses in an essay uh, on dramatic narrative epistemological crises in the history of science, I think is the title, in which a, a particular tradition, and he's talking specifically about uh, scientific traditions there, comes to a crisis where it cannot answer its own questions or fails to work in the world the way that it's expected to. So now there's a crisis in our rationality. Why are we failing in this way? Uh, I've already alluded to the crisis of uh, Western European traditions, of which I include uh, the United States as part of that, in terms of the climate. We've come to a point where we're not succeeding. We are at an epistemological crisis today. The fact that we don't see it as part of the crisis, of course, right? That it's the fact that we don't see it as an epistemological crisis and that we think that we can answer it with the same kinds of epistemology that we've used over the last 400 years is part of the crisis that we've uh, come to. And so it takes us to learn from another tradition, either where we went wrong and how to fix it, or simply why we're wrong and have to be abandoned. Okay, so now, of course, the interesting thing from Thomas Kuhn or Paul Feyerabend in terms of science is that they'll say something like, well, the old, the old tradition is not ever let go until people die, right? And the new generation is born right. and they come, right? Hopefully that's not true, right? Hopefully we can understand what's wrong with our lived traditions and adopt a new one so that we can solve the crisis that we face and live a better life. Now we see that at the personal level in a number of ways, right? When people have conversions, whether they're religious conversions or whether they just move countries or whatever it, whatever it is, or maybe they leave one field uh, of employment to do something else, right? So we see that on everyday level that people face these kinds of epistemological crises, which are at the same time existential crises. What we need today is the realization from the vast majority of people in Western Europe and the US to recognize that we are in this epistemological crisis and seek out one or two traditions by which we might understand how we came to this crisis. And 
Um, so now, now I, I, you, in the beginning, in the beginning of, or at the beginning of uh, the, this interview, you mentioned how um, you like to integrate um, Roman Catholicism with your work, or you like to work on um, Roman Catholicism. So um, I'd be curious to know how would um, you integrate um, the Roman Catholic um, faith and tradition with um, basically what we've been talking about today about um, tradition and reason. Yeah, so uh, I am a Roman Catholic, so it helps a little bit there. <laughs> uh, and, and for me, I guess that is a second first language to a certain extent. I didn't, I was, I'm not a cradle Catholic. Mm. I came into the faith uh, as a young child. Um, and certainly I'm still growing in the faith in a number of ways. And hopefully always will be. What I think is important for the Roman Catholic tradition is the variety of practices that we have and the tradition that we have that helps us to evaluate the kinds of lives that we live. Uh, and it's of course interesting that you're asking this question two days before Lent begins because that's the time of evaluating and assessing what it is that we're doing and how we might do it better and become better Christians. For me, most of my research in Roman Catholicism is in the Catholic social thought tradition, uh, begun in 1891 with Rerum Novarum by uh, Leo XIII, and um, most recently in, in some of Pope Francis's works. And to think about how the gospel and the life of the church as a lived church, not a hierarchical church, but as a lived church, helps us to understand where our good lies in relationship to practical reasoning and our community. And I think that gets filled out more thoroughly in the liberation theology tradition uh, with Gutierrez and uh, Archbishop Romero uh, and a number of other people that, that we can think about there. The, for me, the, the practical import is to think about the Eucharist as this moment of simplicity in which we belong to and become part of and are reconciled with the divine, right? So we're accepting the, the, the body of Jesus as we eat and drink the Eucharist. So how does that connect to the kinds of lives that we live on an everyday level? Well, there's certainly sacrifice there, right? But there's also unity and community towards this larger good. And I think that's what's interesting for me is the way that McIntyre early on connected Marxism to Christianity by calling Marxism a, a heresy. Mm -hmm. Because what Marxism does wrong is it says, well, there is no God or it, it lacks this belief in God, but it still has this gospel message about the unity of, of the community mm. and the unity with the poor. And so McIntyre ends his first book, uh, Marxism and Interpretation, with this call to live uh, as a community of prayer and poverty. And that's certainly a hard call to ask for, right? But it's still the one that I think is the most important from the gospel message. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. So I guess before we conclude, I, I would like to ask you um, about your forthcoming book. Uh, did you say it was Love and Politics? Love and Politics, Persistent Human Di Desires as a Foundation for a Politics of liberation which will be out from rutledge in june mm -hmm, right so uh could you perhaps tell us more about it and it, would you consider is it a sequel to um uh, to, to your book reason tradition and the good or uh it's a sequel in a loose sense oh. uh, because it picks up some of the challenges so i i received a variety of uh wonderful reviews about reason tradition and the good but many of them came to the same two questions how do we keep Marxism and Christianity together? And how can a politics of the common goods be emancipatory? Uh, and so what I try to do in love and politics 
is to answer those two questions by going back to Plato and Aristotle, going back to metaphysics and using that as a stepping point to look at where McIntyre's philosophy fails. And so I do this critique of McIntyre from a Frankfurt School perspective, why, does, why, is, why are there no resources within McIntyre's Aristotelian philosophy to talk about the domination of nature, which is central to what the Frankfurt School is doing? And tied to that, why is there no discussion of the sexual division of labor and reproductive labor in McIntyre, as there is to some extent in Marx? And I use the practices of obstetrics and midwifery to center those kinds of concerns and develop a, a theory of love as erotic being to fill out what the common goods are and what practices are. All right. Uh, well, um... I, I guess um, before we close out, um, do you have any any anything you'd like to say? Um, well, I'd love to say many more things. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, thank you very much for this interview. It, it really helped me think about my work uh, carefully, and I appreciate that you gave me that opportunity and to to share it with others. I'm trying to uh, do this in a way, not just with this interview, but more uh, importantly with. Um, the blog that I don't keep very well, but I'm trying to, to reinvigorate and uh, starting a podcast to think about these kinds of concepts at a practical everyday level. Um, so thank you for giving me some inspiration and some motivation for carrying on with this kind of work. Um, my pleasure. And uh, so where can people go to, um, uh, to find out more about you and your work? You mentioned your blog, your YouTube channel. And- so my, I have a website, Jeffrey L. Nicholas, and Jeffrey spelled weirdly, J-E-F-F-E-R-Y-L-N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S dot com. And I'll put a link uh, to the podcast there, but that's where the blog is kept. Uh, you'll see some past discussions of politics. I have a secondary blog on science fiction, which is um, should be connected on that website, but it's I Aim to Misbehave dot jeffrey l nicholas.com where i look at science fiction as a political discourse as well Uh, so those would be the best places to go right now but thank you for asking